Hi folks, it's 2x2 two two Legoto here, um, coming to you from the farm on YouTube. It is a beautiful sunny day on the farm as I look out my big picture window. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about um, the diseases and health um, issues that Legoto have. I'll also be addressing why I have my puppy buyers, be it a companion home, an agility home, a show home, um, well for obvious reasons a show home because they'll become a breeding animal at some point, but why do I care about having my puppies tested later? We'll talk about that too. Um, first let me start with a couple of the simple or genetic issues, and I say simple because these three things are entirely avoidable meaning if you're a reputable breeder and you're testing and then maintaining proper ethics within that testing, you're not ever going to have a puppy that has any of these three diseases that I'm getting ready to talk about. Um, the first one and the kind of the newest on the scene, um, if you will, get my piece of paper here for my notes, um, is H-U-U, -U, and that is hyperuricosuria. Hypouricosuria. Hypouricosuria. Say that really fast several times. Um, there are several different breeds that are affected by this, um, including the Legoto. And we test this... Um, at our kennel. Our kennel is entirely free, so I don't um, technically ever need to test puppies that are born to any of my parents. Um, I will test breeding animals just to make sure I have the little certificate that says they're negative for this. Um, but let me talk about it. So H-U-U, or hyperuricosuria, is a disease in which there's, and this is straight from Optogen's website. So some of it I'm reading, some of it I'm ad-libbing um, from my own experience. Um, and um, if I have any questions or something I don't know, I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna, oh, I thought I had glasses on my head. Um, thought that, uh, I'm not gonna mislead you. So, sorry for that sidetrack there. Um, so what happens with HUU or hyperuricosuria is that there's an excessive excretion of uric acid in the urine and that then predisposes the dog to bladder stones um, which can result in a urinary obstruction. Now speaking to you as someone who's had a kidney stone, dude, you do not want your dog to have this. It is uh, kidney stones are so painful. I've had two 10 pound plus babies and a kidney stone. I, I asked the doctor to just let me die. I just wanted to die. I cannot imagine the pain that a pet would go through. Little bladder, thin, um, it, it just would be bad. So, um, the mutation, there's um, one mutation, it's the um, SLC2A9, um, and that, um, it's been proposed that the inefficient transport um, associated with this mutation, it diminishes reabsorption of uric acid and so if you're diminishing the reabsorption, you've got all that buildup of the uric acid, and then that causes the stones to um, form. And um, that elevated level of uric acid in the urine, like I said, if, it, if a stone develops, it's very painful, and then it, it turns into an obstruction, which means they can't urinate, which is uh, actually can be fatal. If you can't urinate, that's fatal. You'll, you'll have lots of problems. Um, 
So making sure that your breeder does not have this in their lines is critical. Um, the DNA test, it's available at a multitude of laboratories that test DNA for dogs. We prefer Optogen, um, and I'll tell you why here in just a minute. Um, so if your dog has a bladder stone, you can almost guarantee, well you can't almost, you can guarantee that their parents carry this mutation, this SLC2A9 mutation. Both parents have to contribute a copy of this, so both of them will be carriers, and they'll contribute this copy, they'll inherit this from both parents, and they'll have a higher risk for developing clinical signs of the disease. So you can have dogs that are affected, technically meaning they inherited the gene from both their parents, so they have HUU, but they never develop symptoms of it. And um, there are things about that, you know, with diet and hydration, that I'm sure if you had a dog that had this, you would you would know, um, and your vet and your breeder could have a discussion about what to do to prevent stones. All right, the next thing is lysosomal storage disease, or LSD. This is another test that any lab can do. Your vet cannot do these tests, uh, but you have to send a swab or a blood sample off to a lab that is um, uh, a recognized laboratory who can do this testing. And um, lysosomal storage disorder, there are diseases that are a group of rare inherited metabolic disorders. Um, they result from the defects in the function of your lysosomes. If you remember from high school biology, lysosomes are the recycling center in the cells. And they're supposed to process unwanted or worn out material into substance that the cells can use. So if the recycling processes are disrupted, the unprocessed material builds up. Eventually, this stored material builds up so much that the cell can't function any longer, resulting in LSD. Inherited LSDs occur across different species, including humans and dogs. I'm reading that straight from Optogen's website. In Lagoto, LSD disease is characterized by a widespread swelling, widespread swelling and an accumulation of um, clear vesicles in the cytoplasm and the long and short of this is that LSD affected dogs show clinical symptoms. They'll have cerebral ataxia, meaning their brain causes them to not be able to walk straight. Um, it'll sometimes be accompanied by episodic nystagmus, which is abnormal eye movements. So the eyes will kind of wiggle back and forth, rapid eye movements. Um, they may seem to not have muscle control of their eyes. There'll be clumsiness, behavior changes, such as restlessness, depression, aggression towards people or other dogs. And the age of onset can range from months to years, and the rate of the disease progression and its severity also varies significantly. So my point with this disease, let's prevent it. If there's a test that will rule out whether my dogs in my breeding program can pass this on or not, by all means, let's do the test and make sure. Um, we don't have a single animal in our breeding program or not in our breeding program, meaning um, placed in a companion home. We don't have anything in our lines that is even a carrier for lysosomal storage disorder. So our entire kennel is lysosomal storage disorder free. And that means we will never have, we will never produce a puppy that has the possibility or is even a carrier for LSD or lysosomal storage disorder. Um, it is um, an autosomal recessive disease, which means that 
only dogs that have inherited two copies, so one from each parent, can um, develop this form of LSD. Uh, so it is critical that your breeder is doing DNA testing. And on the front end, every dog that we imported um, into our breeding program and use in our breeding program, is they have all been tested and are free from even being a carrier. We don't even have carriers. So, you know, you might argue that, well, I can breed this carrier to a normal, and that might work for junior epilepsy, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but it, I don't even want, there's no cure for this. So, um, why even this playing with fire if you've got a carrier in your program? So, um, that's the good thing about this. So... <clears throat> the next thing is benign familial junior epilepsy, BFJE for short, or JE, junior epilepsy, for even shorter. Um, this is another inherited neurological disease. It incurs, um, so the thing to know about this is that, um, again, it's autosomal recessive, so you have to have two copies of the gene present in a puppy in order for a puppy to become affected. Carriers are not affected. They're never affected. They'll never be able to develop the disease. We currently have two carriers in our program and they are never, they're father and daughter, so they would never be bred to each other. Um, in a perfect world, of course, we would love to have a JE, um, in completely JE-free kennel. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit more here in a second, but let me finish telling what JE is. So it is exactly what it sounds like, juvenile epilepsy, epilepsy that develops in juveniles. Um, there have been rare adult cases of junior epilepsy in adults, um, so my talk is primarily going to be about the ju the juniors, the juvenile, the young dogs. Um, I have heard it developing as young as five weeks. So let's, for this example, talk as if a breeder had two carriers. So that's a positive negative or a plus minus, and they're carriers, meaning they have one copy each adult, each breeding animal, has one copy of this junior epilepsy gene, and they bred to each other on purpose or accidentally, and they had puppies. So in that litter of puppies, there will be affected puppies, plus plus, meaning they have two copies of the genes now, one from each parent. And somewhere around five weeks of age, um, they will develop junior epilepsy. It is usually gone by the time the puppies are 16 weeks of age from what my breeders in Italy and Romania and Europe have told me. I've seen videos of young puppies who have this and it's terrible. Yes, it's gone by the time they're 16 weeks old with generally no lasting effects. But if we can prevent this by doing a simple DNA test and not having those animals in the breeding program, then by all means, let's do it. Having said that, I would not throw the baby out with the bathwater if it meant having a quality animal in a rare breed with a rare pedigree, such as Dexter. He's our carrier in our program. Um, and his daughter is a carrier. She's also in our program. Clearly, they would never be bred together um, because that would produce affected puppies. And again, just to remind you at the beginning of our conversation, I was very implicit about the fact that carriers can never have junior epilepsy. Only affected, meaning they've gotten two copies of the gene from each parent, they're the only animals that can have junior epilepsy. So what does junior epilepsy do? Well, they develop seizures, they can develop 
ataxia. Um, and it is primarily characterized, as I mentioned, by seizures. Um, so, in, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but there were breeders before it became um, a popular breed in the United States and we began importing them. There were breeders that um, were rather indiscriminate about this and they weren't testing. And now, um, I think everyone's on board now, I hope, um, but I'm not paying attention, too terribly close attention to everybody's program overseas. So, um, about, I think it was seven or eight years ago, um, when we first started our program 10 years ago, we were sending, so for the first two years of our program, we were sending all our testing over to Finland, um, which was great, except it's in another country and it takes forever and it was expensive because you had to convert the dollar to the euro to be able to pay for the testing. And, um, you know, by the time we wanted the results, um, the turnaround time because of air shipment and then customs and it was just, um, it was a mess. And so um, I thought, um, hey, why don't we find a lab here in America that will do this? And I'm very happy to report that about eight years ago, our kennel was responsible for um, contacting Optogen and assisting Optogen in setting up their um, base lab testing for junior epilepsy. Um, someone came along after me and set up the lysosomal storage disorder and the HUU. Um, of course, by that time, um, things had gone a little more mainstream, but um, this big thing, the familial um, junior epilepsy, JE, we helped um, Optogen get that set up and um, we're very proud of that. Um, it is, um, it just meant a lot for us to work with Optogen on that. And that's all I have to say really about those. So here in our kennel, our kennel is completely HUU free, completely lysosomal storage disorder free, and all of our adults are tested for junior epilepsy. Um, a lot of our adults in our breeding program, um, because of the way we've managed it, breeding normal to normal, the, all of the puppies in a normal to normal breeding will be normal. Um, we're still testing everybody um, just because it's the right thing to do and we have the test available. So um, if you purchase a puppy from us, it will be reflected in your um, health records about your puppy's status. And the very worst, they would be a carrier. But again, a carrier is, um, is as benign as it sounds because they can never, ever develop junior epilepsy. So those are the three genetic tests that we have available to us. Um, there's a couple of other tests, and this is where my puppy people come in um, and help me out. And it's in all our contracts that our puppy buyers um, do annual eye exams, and that has to be done with a veterinary ophthalmologist. Um, there's usually almost always one or two in your town. You'll have your pick. Um, and that is called a SERF exam. That is C-E-R-F. Canine Eye Research Foundation, I think is what it stands for. Ooh, I've always called it SERF, and I think I'm just having a brain fart about what it stands for. So if you ever go on the SERF website, you'll be able to find an ophthalmologist in your area, or your veterinarian can tell you about one. Your regular veterinarian cannot do this test. This test costs about $25 to $55, depending on your town and your veterinarian, your veterinary ophthalmologist. And it requires, it's a two-part exam. The first part, the veterinarian will put on his or her little um, special 
eye looking tool it's a little hood that goes over with an um a nice little um, magnifying scope looking thing that goes over their eye and they'll look in your dog's eye with the lights on with the lights off and then they will put a special um kind of drops in the eye that will allow them to see all the way back to the retina and then they'll come back in a few minutes later look at that give your dog a clear or not clear now here's the thing there's not too many things going on with Lagoto eyes there are some breeds that um, are derivatives have come from the Lagoto they've been derived from the Lagoto that do have some eye issues and so it's prudent to check your Lagoto's eyes I require it of my pet people so that I know in five years, 10 years, 20 years, that my breeding program is on track. And that's why I require it. So that's an annual thing. You can do it on their birthday or shortly after or around their birthday. Make that exam appointment. Make it every year. And great. That's how you keep your warranty with us in effect is by completing that eye exam. The second thing that I require of my, even my companion animal um, owners, so everybody who gets a puppy from me, this is required of. The second part is the hips. And I'm going to give you my little spiel about hips. Um, hip dysplasia is a polygenetic trait. That means that there's a lot involved. There's, um, so all the stars align and your dog doesn't have hip dysplasia. That means everything was done right with their foundation, and we work really hard on puppy foundations here so that they're walking on something that is a um, solid surface that is not slick. Um, we use um, a special kind of uh, foam underneath, and then on top of that is their um, pad, and then on top of that yet is kind of a fleece um, it's got a fleece top and a rubber back on the bottom and that allows for great growth development hip development ligature musculature um, helps a lot with that so they're not sliding around um, the other thing about hips that can affect hip dysplasia aside from genetics is because it's a polygenetic trait, nutrition. If you're feeding a crappy food, guess what? Your bones and joints are probably going to revolt. Um, if your breeder's breeding program is willy-nilly and they've got two bitches and a dog that they are just breeding to make companion puppies, even though they're well cared for, that's not advancing the breeding program. That's not advancing the breed, and I caution you against that. So the other thing that can affect your dog's potential for getting hip dysplasia, you come from good stock, they've got the, your, your adult breeding program, they've all been health tested, and now you're getting a puppy from this breeder, and you exercise you over exercise your puppy you allow it to go up and down too many stairs too soon you're not carrying your puppy to help it avoid those hard um, jolting drops stops etc you start agility runs at six or nine months of age you decide that you're going to take your puppy on a five mile run um, there's a lot of environmental factors at play also. That's why it's called polygenetic, because there's several things. You've got your genetic code that comes from both your parents. You've got environment, starting when they're a puppy. And you've got nutrition. And that's just the three major things that can affect this, um, affect hip dysplasia. So. When is hip testing done? All right, so we have two ways to test hips. The first is called OFA, Orthopedic Foundation of America. You can 
do that testing anywhere between 15 and 24 months of age, it needs to be done by the time they're two, for sure. But, um, I'm sorry, that's pin hip. OFA cannot be done until they are two years old. So on or sometime after their second birthday, all the way up to 36 months, OFA can be done. Why would I want to use OFA? Um, you can use OFA because most veterinarians can do this. Now, when I say most of them, you're going to want a veterinarian who is seeing a lot of breeders or hunting dog um, owners because they're going to know how to get the hip placement and how to do it correctly. I, I caution you against using a veterinarian who says, oh, sure, I can do that. Can do it and should do it are two different things. So if you use your regular veterinarian who has very little experience with this or rare opportunities to do OFA hip x-rays, um, and it comes back, something's wrong, I'm going to make you do it again, and I'm going to have you go to a veterinarian that I recommend. So you should just, on the front end, ask me who you should use for this. And all of my puppy people, um, you know, we, we talk about this on the front end, we talk about it in our training call, we talk about it um, when they come to pick the puppy up, and I'm in contact with all my puppy people, making sure that they're getting their hips done. So that's when it's done. It's done between 24 months and 36 months. It's about $150 to a $350 one-time test. It is an x-ray. It does need to be done with um, an under anesthesia. So planning something else for this, like... Um, maybe spaying and neutering, um, maybe having a dental done, um, maybe have some kind of surgical repair that you needed to have done. Um, I've been raising Legoto for 10 years and I just had um, an, an umbilical hernia show up. Um, it isn't genetic, it's the, the mom was very aggressive in cleaning up the umbilical cords and caused a minor umbilical hernia. That would be a perfect time to get that repaired when the dog is going under anesthesia for OFA. So the veterinarian does this x-ray. They fill out this little form. You sign it, and the veterinarian will send that form in along with the digital x-rays that they just took to the company called OFA. Orthopedic Foundation of America. They're out of Missouri. And they this is all they do. When that test arrives at OFA headquarters, it is then dispersed to three different veterinary radiologists who give it the thumbs up or thumbs down. There's um, mild, moderate, extreme hip dysplasia. And then there's excellent, good, and fair. Excellent, good, and fair are all passing. This is a very subjective test. Even though you've got three people looking at it, they're looking at and giving their opinion of what they see in that x-ray film. So um, it, it is what it is, and that's the test available to us, even though it's very subjective. Um, they kind of toss out the highest score and toss out the lowest score and everybody has to come to some kind of agreement. So I've always kind of thought, well, if um, Dr. Joe Blow didn't have his coffee that morning or he got a flat tire on his way to work, and I don't mean any disrespect, but we're all humans and I'm in a bad mood looking at hip x-rays, um... I might not be the friendliest. I also think that when OFA is doing their comparisons, it's not compared Legoto to Legoto. It, it, and it, it's just not. It's like I said, it's very subjective. So, um, but you do what you have access to, and that's 
That's why you develop a relationship with a breeder who backs up every word they have in their contract. And it's because it is worth the paper it's written on to some extent, except when you have an ethical breeder who wants to know everything there is to know about their puppy's long-term health. So then we have the other test available to us is called pen hip. And that's P-E-N-N -N, and the word hip, pen hip. When can this be done? That can be done between 15 and, um, well, I think pen hip does it up to 36 months also um, for a matter of reporting. Why choose pen hip over OFA? Well, it is a very objective test. And you have to have a specialized veterinarian who has been certified to be able to do the pen hip testing. So your regular vet, unless they're pen hip certified, cannot do this. Um, so I like that. I like that there's extra training that has gone into um, someone's ability to be able to do this. Again, it is a test that is done under anesthesia. Um, it's a very light anesthesia for both tests. Um, the whole thing takes about 30 minutes, if that. Um, and um, your dog will not be able to eat after midnight. Not a big deal. Schedule it first thing in the morning. So you can pick them up by lunchtime and they're having dinner by 4 or 5 o'clock. You really, by the time you pick your dog up, you won't ever know that they were anesthetized. Um, so that's the good news about both of these tests. Um, I've talked about who does the pen hip. Um, it is a... When they send these digital films off to Pinhip, Pinhip then, and very quickly, the turnaround time is amazing with Pinhip. Um, four to six weeks on OFA and maybe seven to 10 days with Pinhip. At least that's my experience. Um, Pinhip will give you a set of measurements, so it's very clinical. <clears throat> and those measurements then fall within certain. Um, percentages within the Legoto breed. So every dog is compared to all the other Legoto that have been tested. That's amazing. I'm not being compared against a German Shepherd or a Belgian Malinois or a Saint Bernard or a Visala or a Greyhound. I'm only sending the dog in and it's only being evaluated against its other peers, if you will. So I like that. It's about $150 to $375. That includes the anesthesia. That includes sending the films off. It depends on your geographical area and, you know, and your vet's pricing. Um, <clears throat> so my thoughts on this, um, I'll tell you a funny story. This is probably, I can't remember how long, 12 years ago? 15 years ago, my son was little still, so about 15 years ago. I went to a seminar at a dog show, and a veterinarian who, he was retired, he showed um, golden retrievers. He um, was an OFA radiologist for many years. They do rotations, by the way, so the same people aren't in there all the time. And he was putting on this seminar, and he had this beautiful golden retriever that sat at his feet the whole time. Um, he competed in confirmation and obedience with his dogs. And maybe he did some hunting. I can't remember. Anyway, um, he went through all these different x-rays and gave all of his reasons and opinions on the evaluations, why one was excellent, good, fair, mildly dysplastic, moderately dysplastic, and and extremely dysplastic and um, you know there was unilateral changes meaning one side was affected and the other wasn't that's typically an injury um, so it's very important when you get a puppy to make sure that your breeder knows those puppies inside and out and maybe even has notes about an injury anyway or tells you um, it was wonderful to be able to look and see how important placement was. So the placement of the hip to the socket to the knee, all of that, to see how important that was 
for getting these clinical evaluations through OFA. At the end of that seminar, he pointed to his beautiful golden retriever and said that all of those films, the excellent, the good, the fair, the mild, the moderate, and the extreme dysplasia were all of the same dog. And it was all dependent upon how that dog's x-ray placement was. So it's very critical that you have a veterinarian who knows what they're doing. And I'm not saying that because your veterinarian doesn't or isn't experienced or familiar with this that they're not a good veterinarian. Absolutely not. It's just everybody has their specialties. So go to a vet who specializes in this and we'll all be happy. Um, the other thing I want to point out to this with this is, and this is one of the things that's in my contract, um, let's say you got your OFA of your two-year-old Lugoto and it comes back mildly dysplastic. And you call me freaked out. Now, let me preface this with, I've never had this happen. I don't anticipate it happening. But I'm not in control. This is a breeding program where I have live animals. And I am, this is why I put things in place. So that if this happens, what's the worst case scenario? So anyway, um, haven't had it happen. Don't, don't anticipate it happening. But um, let's say you call me, you're freaked out, you're crying, you're having a complete meltdown because Fluffy got results that say mild dysplasia from OFA. Well, I'm going to tell you that we just paid for a medical practitioner's opinion on whether your dog might develop hip dysplasia. That OFA result that comes back, it comes back in a little, all breeders know this, it comes back in a little envelope. It's um, a, about, well, it's half a sheet of paper. And I can tell by the window um, what it's going to be. Um, I used to raise Aussies and I had one Australian Shepherd that I purchased from another breeder who shall remain nameless and the puppy came black dysplastic. We spayed her and she never developed hip dysplasia. So that's my point. You can have something come back on paper that says this clinical evaluator, this medical practitioner, <clears throat> has judged this as being um, or having the probability, a high probability of developing hip dysplasia. It is not a medical diagnosis. That form that comes in the mail, that half sheet of paper with a little window, if it's green, you're good. If it's not green, come shining through that little window, it's bad. Had that happen one time with an Aussie, and that's how I know. That envelope comes back and it's uh, white showing through the window. That's not good. However, that does not mean your dog has dysplasia. It is that medical professional's opinion that they could develop it. So it's not a medical diagnosis. And um, that, that just is the propensity or the proclivity for that particular dog to potentially develop hip dysplasia. Um, I think hip dysplasia is a problem in the breed. I think there are several lines in Europe and in America that are more inclined to have those problems. Um, we worked very hard on the front end 10 years ago, 12 years ago actually, when researching and 10 years ago when we had first started importing um, to make sure that we had done a long, long um, list of research questions and just lots of research. The database for Logoto, talking and talking and talking and talking to so many breeders um, and just evaluating their programs um, to make sure that our stock isn't going to have that issue. Now, can I promise? No, I, don't, I can't. I, I mean, there's so many things, like I said in the beginning, because hip dysplasia is a polygenetic trait, there are things way outside of my control. 
nutrition? Are you going to keep feeding the puppy what I tell you to? Exercise? Are you going to go crazy with exercising this puppy and and not manage um, not manage its exercise um, and endurance building? Um, and you know, I things I do have control over. I have control over their foundational nutrition. I have control over the foundational nutrition of my breeding adults. Um, you know, we use supplements and and um, bone and hip supplements, and um, we feed an excellent food. And then also the environment in which my puppies are raised in. I absolutely have control over that, and I am hyper vigilant about that. Um, you know, coming from a breed that had a huge, exponential issue with hip dysplasia, uh, and I'm proud to say I never bred an Australian Shepherd that had hip dysplasia. So, but really, it, it's it's not all me. I mean, I can do what I can do, but at the end of the day, um, God takes over. Um, and they're live animals. So that's kind of my soapbox about hip dysplasia. So we've talked about um, hip dysplasia, eye issues, um, and the eye issues I'm talking about, I did not touch on that, are cataracts. Um, I personally have not heard of any Legoto that I know of or in our program that have cataracts. I have heard through the grapevine that there have been some, but I can't report on who or whose dogs um, because it's just grapevine stuff. So I know it's kind of out there. And when I first imported the Legoto, I was adamant about testing eyes, even though nobody had really started doing that yet, um, with the exception of, I think, two breeders in North America. Now it's fairly standard um, and ethical practice. We've also talked about junior epilepsy. We talked about lysosomal storage disorder um, in terms of genetic issues. And um, we've also talked about um, hyperuric I can never say it. Hyperuric H U U. Hyperuricorsuria, the bladder stone issue. That's a tongue, twist, tongue twister. All right, so um, check out our Facebook page, um, 2 by 2 Legoto. Check out our um, website, 2 by 2 Legoto at Comcast.net. That's my email address, sorry. And my website, 2 by 2 legotocom If you are interested in um, touching base with me, you can email me, um, contact me through Facebook. I would love it if you would like this, um, share it, and subscribe to our YouTube page. Um, peace out, and have a great day. Thanks for watching.